first question is, how did you originally become involved with Professor Churchill and I involved, or even any personal experience? I can't remember when we met, but uh, over the years, I've known him casually, I've read a lot of his writings. Uh, when the latest uh, incidents that came up, I signed petitions in support of his right of academic freedom. All right. Well, uh, let's see. I did notice some quotes that you had made to, to the local media in Colorado around this. It seemed that you were very supportive of his right to free expression while trying to avoid the issue of choice of content. And I wasn't so much trying to avoid the issue. I, first of all, it's irrelevant. Uh, so yes, in that sense, I would avoid it. Uh, but secondly, I didn't really know what it was or care. Since that time, have you have you had any interest in, in seeing the original essay? And, no. It's not, no. Okay. okay. All right. And um, one of the statements that I thought was um, was very here is that, um, uh, or very interesting is that um, you, you did say that you have read a good amount of his work or a fair amount of his work, and either find it excellent. Sure. Uh, was there anything in that work that that today seems to stand out, or that you might say that you thought was impressive scholarship? I had read his work on COINTEL Pro, which is a topic I'd worked on too since the 1970s. So I was interested in it. I thought they. He and an associate did uh, very good work on uh, collecting the documentary record, on analysis and commentary. Uh, I have read his work, some of his work, not all of it, on uh, colonialism, on uh, history of Native Americans. Uh, a lot of it, I thought, was, uh, was well done. Got me looking at sources and so on. I can't really comment in detail without going back to look at it carefully. Sure. Now. One of, the, one of the statements I thought was very interesting that you had mentioned was right now he is uh, under investigation by, I guess, the the, the next step of the, the review can be consisting of five people that are to make the final determination on the, the remaining charges brought against him, which I believe are plagiarism and um, academic fraud. Um, the other charges, free, um, which in terms of freedom of expression, ethnic identity, have been dropped. Um, you, made, you made a statement that I found interesting, and uh, it, you had mentioned that um, if these charges were serious, they would have been brought up before. And um, and really um, thought that these charges might be more of a red herring after the fact. Um, I thought I would, would add some information to that because the Rocky Mountain News actually did a good sized piece on all the instances that Native American groups and individuals, um, including those in academia, did bring questions about his scholarship beforehand, even at the, before he was tenured. Was there an investigation? There was no investigation. That's my point. Mm -hmm. The investigation came after the collapse of the charges against him. For that reason alone, it's pretty hard to take him seriously. Mm -hmm. Now people can make charges anytime they feel like. But it is possible, too, that even though it does bring um, suspicion, that it, it still is. And it, it doesn't, doesn't bring suspicion. suspicion. Anyone who's in the public eye, can, it can be denounced from all over the place. Look, when I go home tonight, I'm going to get the usual dose of 100 emails or so. And I can predict that there'll be a selection among them from at least four of the internet industries. There are huge internet defamation industries that are operating. Uh, one of the four will be, or maybe several, uh, proving that I'm uh, supporting Osama bin Laden. Uh, second will be proving that I want all Jews to be sent to crematoria. Third will be proving that I'm a CIA agent trying to undermine the left. A fourth will be that I'm a Mossad agent trying to destroy Palestinian rights. And then there'll be a couple of others, like, uh, you know, I want uh, to kill ch babies or whatever it may be. But at least these four industries will be going, because they're going strong and they have a lot behind them. Uh, so, and does that make any difference? I mean, anyone who's in the public eye, if you can't respond to what they say, you defame. I mean, if it's a really violent state, like our colonies, you don't have to fame. You blow their brains out, like that picture over there, uh, which is what happens to intellectuals in U.S. colonies. In this case, it happens to be El Salvador. Six leading Jesuit intellectuals had their brains blown out. Over on the right is the archbishop who was assassinated. That's what we do to people in places where we can use force. At home, you can't do that, so you have defamation. So the fact that uh, Churchill was defamed simply shows he's saying something interesting. So it almost becomes like a badge of honor. It's not a bad badge of honor. It comes with the turf. That was actually um, what, I, what I was referring to was um, 
you know, sometimes being out there, being in the public area, charges do get brought after the fact, too. But doesn't that also come with the territory? No. No. If charges come at a, if charges are legitimate, they'll come not timed after a case has fallen apart. I mean, that doesn't prove the charges are illegitimate, but to any rational person, it raises very high suspicions that the charges are just uh, after the failure to carry out a totally illegitimate inquiry. And my question would be that the, the original C review committee, I believe, consisted of a dozen people, a dozen people whose peers decided that the charges did have merit to go to uh, the charges of plagiarism. And when were they brought? Um, those charges were... They were brought on the occasion of a different charge, namely a charge about a talk he gave on 9-11. That's when the other charges came along. That alone tells any rational person that it's pretty hard to take this seriously. If the charges were legitimate, why did they wait for that occasion? And then would the, would the question then fall on these people on the committee as their, their actions to arouse suspicion? In my opinion, their being on the committee arouses suspicion. What right does a university or a state or anyone have to question what uh, some uh, academic figure says? Could there, in the area of academic freedom, um, on the other side, uh, academic responsibility? I do understand the part that you're saying is that these charges could are brought after the fact that they were never um, that CU did not decide to pursue them, regardless if they were ever brought to their attention. Um, is there an area that in these charges of academic responsibility, in terms of it seems they're questioning whether he did follow proper scholarship? Have you seen anything like that? Well, that would be possible. You could take the entire Harvard faculty and investigate them as to how, whether they follow proper scholarly procedures, and I am certain you will find a huge number of cases where they don't. Uh, if you want me to give you examples, I can, where people publish respected people, you know, distinguished professors, publish what they know to be outright lies, uh, fabrication, for the purpose of defamation, for the purpose of state worship, and so on. There's case after case about this. I mean, I've actually published some of them, most of them I don't bother with because I don't like to explore these gutters. Uh, but if anyone wants to carry out such inquiry, it'll be easy. You know, take the, uh, tell you right where to start. It's, it seems like from Churchill's case, because um, Churchill has been no newcomer to statements that could be considered uh, controversial, but now, is it really the subject of 9-11, or is it more to it than that that you see from external forces? Look, I don't frankly know what he said about 9-11, and I don't care. But there's plenty of, but statements that are controversial are all over the place. I mean, open any newspaper, any scholarly article, take any topic you want. Uh, take, for, take, say, perhaps the most covered topic in the last uh, 40 years, the war in Vietnam. The statements that are made about that 100% of the time, close to that, are not only controversial, but outrageous. For example, try, I was just reading Foreign Affairs last night. Alvin Laird was giving his version of the war in Vietnam. Nobody would see anything wrong with it. Uh, he takes the conventional framework. The U.S. intervened to defend South Vietnam from North Vietnamese aggression. And then, did we do it right? Did we do it wrong? And so on. Every one of those statements is an outright lie. Uh, the United States invaded to attack South Vietnam. Uh, before the North Vietnamese were ever even significantly involved, the United States had practically wiped out South Vietnam. Furthermore, that can be demonstrated from their own sources. But can anybody say that? No. What you have to say is lies and deception of a kind that we would regard as utterly outrageous if they appeared in the old Soviet Union. Uh, we can start from there. You want to go on? Yeah, there are, con there are statements that are not only controversial, but outlandish on just any topic you want. Do we investigate them? Do we investigate the whole faculty for that? No. That's not the way to deal with it. The way to deal with it is to expose it, not to investigate it. Would you say that also there could be different standards for a public official as opposed to somebody in... Um, every, every academic works is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just how you want to run through the academic literature. It all takes the same premises. I just happen to be reading this. All right. Well, I would like to go more into the... Um, 
the issues of academic freedom and freedom of speech. I mean, I, I've read, read a lot that um, Lee Pepper and Harm have done, uh, especially in the area of protecting the rights of people who were probably outside of most people's comfort zone, including probably especially in academia itself. I'm just skipping over the questions you've already answered. I would like to ask something of you first in terms of the Jewish reference. Um, you, I know you mentioned that you, you didn't really um, choose to follow the speech, but it has been brought up time and time again in Churchill's speech. Um, the 9-11 essay that he wrote. Um, but one thing that has actually caused quite a bit of controversy was the comparison of the people involved in financial business in the World Trade Center of the equivalent of a Nazi officer, Adolf Eichmann. Um, the term technocrats was thrown out, and the term little Eichmanns was thrown out. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you may be with, with Adolf Eichmann in the sense. Okay, you I would I would like to ask you about the comparison that he makes in saying that these people were little Eichmanns because even though they weren't the ones doing the killing, they knew about that their actions would cause mass killings of the third world from imperialism, but they chose not to act upon that. My question is based on this information. Do you think that's an accurate reference? Well, fairly plausible and I think standard picture of Eichmann is Hannah Arendt. Uh, nobody thought she was a Nazi, at least I didn't. Her picture of Eichmann was that he was a technocrat, didn't really pay much attention to what he was doing. That's what she her phrase, the banality of evil comes from that. So if that's what Eichmann was doing, a technocrat moving things around without paying attention, then a little Eichmann would be a minor variant of that who's also pushing papers around and not paying attention to what he's doing. It's not a comparison I would make, but uh, certainly not an outrageous comparison. Some Jewish groups have, have mentioned that they, they do consider an outrageous comparison, and that is, that is their issue, too. And I, I've read um, the same about the banality of evil. Um, could, though, another argument be made, a plausible argument? I mean, it's not just banality, because there has to come an awareness and not caring, but I think what you've also written a lot of is that how many people choose to make themselves unaware of the events that do happen around the world from U.S. policy. So does that still qualify as banality, or is that more in terms of ignorance or not? That's who it is. The ordinary person on the street is probably ignorant. I mean, if you're flooded with massive reporting, education, uh, uh, scholarly literature, if you read it, which says, for example, that the U.S. was defending South Vietnam, how are you supposed to, well, what, what's going to keep you from believing? Uh, you know, unless you really search. So that's ignorance. If we're talking about the people who have better access to information, uh, it shades off into deceit. I mean, take anyone acquainted enough with Vietnam to have actually looked at the Pentagon Papers, say, or to have read Bernard Fall, who by everybody's, let's say the Pentagon's position is that he's the one civilian specialist who has to be taken seriously. He's the only person, he's the only non-government person even mentioned in McNamara's memoirs. And he's understood, he was a hawk, and he was understood to be the leading military historian and Vietnam specialist and hawkish. Well, in 1967, he wrote that Vietnam, as a, this is almost a quote, as a cultural and historical entity is likely to become extinct under the attack of the most uh, you know, horrendous uh, military assault that's ever happened in modern times. He was talking about South Vietnam. Is that how you defend South Vietnam? By destroying it to the point where it might become extinct? according to the leading specialist who happens to be a hawk. Well, anybody who's read at least that far, and this is the major scholar, and knows the background, and then says we were defending South Vietnam, well, at this point, we're moving beyond banality. And that's uh, pretty close to 100% of scholarship. Well, it really 